We are uh, glad everyone could make time tonight to listen to this. I think we're going to be very dynamic panel. Um, we may wait just one more minute to allow a few more late arrivals to, to come on into the room. Um, while we're doing that, uh, my name is Greg Kimball. I'm the Director of Public Services and Outreach here at the Library of Virginia. And I welcome you on behalf of, uh, of the library. All right, well, let's get, get rolling. Um, I'm delighted that the library is partnering with Angel Lee and C. Shamoon and the Jackson Project. Uh, on this series of uh, panels, discussions. I met Asisha uh, about a year ago, I think it was, right in the height of the pandemic. Uh, and she came to the library with what I thought was a pretty simple question. Uh, who, who was Jackson? That simple question seems to have expanded <laughs> quite a bit into a really dynamic uh, research project that's resulted in programs, art installations, public conversations like the one we're going to have tonight. Obviously, we're celebrating to some uh, part of this is to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Jackson Ward. Um, appropriate to our panel tonight, the ward was born out of a racist gerrymander, but was reimagined by its residents as a dynamic center of Black success and entrepreneurship. And I think those are really the core ideas that I've taken away from the work we've done together. Um, so without for, and by the way, uh, you can go to the Jackson project website to learn more. It's T H E J X N P R O J E C T.com. So I am going to turn things over, uh, to the moons and thanks again for coming. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. You have a kind of like radio voice, by the way, <laughs> you can reach them at you can tell I've done a lot of media stuff, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So yes, we are the Moon Sisters. I'm Cisha Joy Moon. This is my sister, Anjali Moon. And we are co-creators of the Jackson Project. And we are just delighted that you guys uh, you know, are spending your Wednesday evening with us uh, for today's discussion on From Gerrymandered to Gentrified. Uh, we have an action-packed panel and we'd like to introduce them. So first up, we have our moderator, Alan Charles Chipman. He is a faith-rooted organizer and transformation strategist. He is a lifelong faith community activist, having started his work at the ripe age of six in his hometown of Baltimore. And the crazy part is I can totally see Alan Charles uh, preaching in the pulpit as a kindergartner. Um, he serves as Initiatives of Change faith-rooted organizer and transformation strategist and recently ran for city council in the sixth district. His past experience includes work as a legislative aide in the Virginia General Assembly and a racial equity advocate at one of Richmond's Fortune 500 companies. He earned his bachelor's, his bachelor's degree in human development and family science from Messiah College. In his free time, he enjoys creating music and recording for his podcast dedicated to Reverend Dar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called A Difference in Thought. Uh, Alan Charles, we are so happy to have you with us and we know you're gonna moderate a great discussion. Uh, next up, we have Brother Iman Shabazz. Before anything, Iman Shabazz is a son, elder, brother, uncle, cousin, friend, and Baba to many. From appearing on CNN's America, American Morning to his own talk show called Fighting for Freedom, Iman has an incessant voice on education, awareness, and organization in the face of racial and social injustices. Among his many hats, he is the policy advisor for community engagement, and reform initiatives in the city, in the office of the Commonwealth Attorney for the city of Richmond, where he helped to organize a dialogue series called Beyond Containment. He has also served as the city's alternatives to incarceration committee or commission. He has also been on the racial and health equity community team and the reimagining public safety task force. He is deep he has a very deep, he said who that? Mm -hmm. He has a, has a deep rooted love for mountain climbing, skydiving, swimming, biking, martial arts, and apparently he has agreed to take anyone on in a mean game of Scrabble. Um, and I might have to take you up on that when this pandemic passes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us tonight, Brother Iman. Awesome. I, I know someone who also want to get in on that Scrabble game, Iman. Uh, Brother Ross, he's a avid Scrabbler. 
Um, next up, we have uh, Sheba Williams. Uh, Sheba was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. She earned her bachelor's degree in business management from Norfolk State University, as well as professional license in cosmetology and barbering and a master instructor's license. In 2012, she began working exclusively as a mobile barber stylist with a clientele spanning from DC to North Carolina. Through her travels, she found that more than one of the people she was working with had one thing in common with her, and that was a felony conviction. Her passion for helping others uh, be, her passion for helping others would be more than, I'm sorry, her passion for helping others would be more than a con conviction for, for more than a conviction led to her starting a nonprofit called No Left Turns in 2016, uh, which began as a support system for those who are, who are justice and court involvement, but quickly in, evolved into a daily fight for removing the policies and stigmas around a past conviction. Welcome, Sheba, we look forward to your voice. Next up, we have brother Duran Chavis. Uh, Duran started his career in community advocacy with the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia. While there, he founded the Happily Natural, Na Na Happily Natural Day Festival, which focused on cultural awareness, health, wellness, and social change. In 2009, he founded Richmond Noir Market, which is a farmer's market that targets low-income communities that are located with, within food deserts across the city. In 2022, he served as a clean, I think we want to say 2020, because I know we Afrofuturists, but that's real in the future. But we're gonna say 2020. In 2020, uh, he served as a clean air ambassador on behalf of Earth Justice and Hip Hop Caucus. In 2010, he was named Style Weekly Style 40 Under 40, where he made the power list in 2014 and 2015. He is alumni of Leadership Metro Richmond and was featured with a fe featured speaker at TEDx RVA. He served as the first community engagement manager at the Lewis Ginsburg Botanical Garden and the inaugural director of the Harding Street Urban Agricultural Center at Virginia State University. In 2020, he unveiled the exhibition called Black Space Matters at the ICA VCU, which helped to highlight issues with food justice and the importance of community spaces for people of color. Brother Duran, all the syllables, all the work. Glad to have you. And last, but most certainly not least, we have Zenobia Bay. Z Bay, the poet as she's known, is a writer and spoken word hip hop artist, along with music, basketball, and uplifting people to the best version of themselves. She pursues her passion as an educator, mentor, and, and community advocate. Through her art and activism with various organizations throughout the Richmond area, she seeks to impact not only communities within the cities, but this country as a whole. In 2012, she founded the grassroots nonprofit called Community 5050, which does great work, by the way, uh, which is a mentoring and outreach program geared towards the betterment of youth and families in Richmond and surrounding localities. She also currently teaches at Six Points Innovation Center and was recently featured as an artist in the RVA Community Makers at VMFA and the Black History Museum and Cultural Center. Zenobia Bay, good friend, long time, great work, huge impact in the city, and we are especially happy to have your voice on this panel. Welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. So with that said, I feel like we're gonna pass the baton, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really have a lot of time to waste because we got a, we got a rich panel and y'all gonna, I know y'all about to get it in. So uh, Brother Chipman, we're gonna pass the baton to you, open things up and we look forward to a robust conversation. And I think, are we doing a post screen? I mean, a post uh, panel Q and A? Yes, yeah, 7.45, we'll open up the chat for questions. We'll open it up. So please uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go. Indeed, thank you so much for the uh, introductions. And it's great to be here with uh, some Richmond legends and anchors and uh, Great to be able to have done some work with uh, each and every one of you all. And so we're, uh, as uh, Anjali and Cecil were correct, I've been preaching since I was six. So that also means a brother can be long-winded. So I'm going to stick uh, <laughs> straight to the questions because it's a lot of uh, content and, and, and uh, conversation we want to have. So my first question uh, to the group, and uh, anyone can answer this one. Uh, the Jackson Project is rooted in celebrating the 150th anniversary of Jackson Ward. The question is, and what has the ward meant to you and your work 
and what do you envision for the ward over the next 150 years? I know we talk jokingly about Afrofuturism, but there will be Black people in the future, amen. And so we just want to know what has the ward meant to your work and um, what do you envision for the ward over the next 150 years? Well, I'll start off by saying that um, personally, the ward has meant a lot because it showed me, I'm from Southside Richmond, I'm a native, um, and being born and raised in Southside Richmond, I didn't see too many entrepreneurships and in business settings, except for the late great um, Coach Jones, Bo Jones Senior, you know, with Pier Seven, but coming to the ward, seeing a lot of um, entrepreneurs, small businesses, it gave hope, and it gave hope to the work and the youth and families that we work with. Um, a lot of the youth and families we work with are in Gilpin Court and Jackson Ward, so it, it it gives us hope to show them that they have space to grow. They have space to grow from you know a rich history. And I think the biggest thing in our work that we do at Community 5050 is really just challenge to educate the people that's in Jackson Ward, in uh, Gilpin Court, that may not know the history to educate them the history. And so that way they can get empowerment from there. So that, that's something that I envision to implement in the work, inspired by the work in the ward and continue to do the work. That's wonderful. Would anyone else like to answer that? Brother Javon? Yeah, let me say this, man. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a I'm a child of Jackson Ward. I mean, I'm born in Richmond. You know what I mean? But my community activism was birthed in Jackson Ward. Very first volunteer opportunities that I took were at Zero Zero Clay Street at the Black History Museum Cultural Center, Virginia. Um, every day, you know, I volunteered. I asked them for a job, and um, you know, eventually they gave me a job and my job was on a daily basis to give tours to young and old, you know, age, elementary school age kids to adults to senior citizens, people from all over the globe that were visiting about the history of Jackson Ward. So uh, I very literally my formative years, this is me at 20, 21, you know what I mean, getting paid six something an hour. To, <laughs> to educate, you know, members of the community about the lo the, the legacy of of Two Street and uh, Jackson Ward in general, um, because of the the community of elders that encircled me at that moment, from Waverly Crawley to um, Mr. Horn to um, you know Basada White, uh, uh, Charles Bethay, Mary uh, Mary Lauderdale. Um, even going back to Brian Little, when he ran the Black History Museum and Cultural Center, like all of those people encircled me and poured into me, you know what I mean? And it was through that intergenerational dialogue that, you know, I was, you know, formed as an activist, as a community person, right? It wasn't because I just jumped off the porch. It was because I had these elders around me supporting me in my activism. Um, and it's where we started Happily Natural Day, you know? Uh, I was I was given the 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 honor of 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 having the responsibility to craft an event right in the back parking lot of the Black History Museum. You know what I mean? So Jackson Ward for me that means that 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 that, that space of entrepreneurship is just is very important to me. But even beyond that, it's the cultural legacy and this intergenerational dialogue that I was privy to by virtue of my early stages of activism in the, in the ward. Um, where do I, uh, where do I see the, the second part of the question was, where do we see the war going? Uh, yes, indeed, for the next 150. Uh, well, I feel a little bleak. I think it's about, I, I think um, there, there will be little uh, or very, very few uh, black owners in Jackson Ward if we see the trends of today continuing, um, unfortunately, but that's, you know, it's very, it's gonna be a very classic situation. So, you know, the only way you be living in Jackson Ward is if you uh, if you're making a, a, a lot of money, and uh, we saw that even when we were back in back in the early 2000s, and so nobody has done anything to undo that, right? Just to be candid, right? So um, unless there's some intervention, significant intervention to change that, I see it only getting worse, baby. I'm sorry to be bleak, but that's just the reality we live in. Well, it's a reason. Yeah. Why I'll go ahead, brother Mon. I just want, oh no, I see she, she would uh, open it up as well. I'll, I'll defer, sis. Um, 
taking it when, when I was young, my mom used to work for RCAP, which was Richmond Community Action uh, Program. And it was on the corner of Lee Street across from um, the church. And that, that was where nonprofit work was. That was where community work started. My goddad lived on um, Marshall Street. We would always have to go to Consolidated Bank, which was the only bank you could pay your rent at if you lived in Rich Redevelopment and Housing Authority property. We used to stand outside of the bank and pay at the window. And then we would go to the community pride across the street and shop in the basement. I'm only 40, y'all. <laughs> but this was this was Jackson Ward. And like if you know about like Dudley's hair and it's, it's still there, you know about like all of the different areas of black entrepreneurship, you saw so much growth and so much in our communities that that built from that. So um like Zaron said, you know, is it's hard to imagine losing and erasing the whole history. We have mm -hmm. the Hippodrome and we have, you know, our restaurants, we have, you know, Soul Kitchen, um, different things like that. But a lot of the history is really being erased. And, and when I say erased, I'm not just talking about the murals on the wall, I'm talking about the people and the culture. Um, you know, Two Street is something everybody know and, and traveled to Jackson War for, but the center of our, our entrepreneurship and our economic empowerment was right there in the heart of the city. And as a little girl with my mom working there, we would always frequent that area and see the, the community and see the neighbors who were, you know, older black people who had lived there for years. You just mm -hmm. don't see it anymore. So, you know, unfortunately, if, if we don't do something about the housing situation and issues and um, how expensive it is to live there. Uh, we're being erased and the culture is going with it aside from like our very like, you know, prominent historic areas that will remain. Indeed, indeed. I, I, I think all of my comrades have mentioned some things that, that resonate with me without question. Uh, what I would like to add, if I can, is I remember as a teenager, uh, one of my best friends used to work in the drug, you know, right there in that same uh, spot across from where Shiva described. Um, and I really thought that was a big thing back then, you know, because, he, you know, one, because I didn't have a job, two, because, you know, I, I mean, as a teenager, I, I, it, it seemed just really important that he was in this particular position. And what I what I realized kind of moving forward as I married that with what I learned about the rich legacy of the Jackson Ward community is that it it, it, it forms a foundation or a basis for us to sankofa. So if I can answer your question on both ends, what it means to me now and what I see moving forward, uh, even in the context of what Duran so adequately out for us in the context of the realities of the class contradictions, uh, I would even say the racialized and oppressed contra contradictions, the reality is, is that there is opportunity for us to learn from a historical space with which we can return. And so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to our continued struggle and continued organized work where hopefully we can have some impact on those conditions that Duran laid out to the point where even if it isn't necessarily a recreation of Jackson Ward, we create and understand the importance of creating our own community spaces and creating the, the basis, if you will, for us to be able to meet our needs as a community in the way that it was done back then. Thank you, and this is this is this is spot on. And brother Duran, uh, you are you are spot on. There's a reason why we called this from gerrymander to gentrified. This this is a, a condition that was created by a series of decisions over time. Uh, it reminds me of when um, James Baldwin called urban renewal uh, Negro removal, right? And so this uh, this this displacement that hunt that happens under the guise of development and the gentrification or what some would say the 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 cultural genocide that happens with these changing populations. And so we know, so I'm gonna read some statistics just to, to, to let uh, the viewers know uh, what the types of changes that we've been seeing, okay? So uh, in, in 2021, the racial identity of, of uh, uh, Richmond and the community has been experiencing an undeniable shift. Uh, per uh, UVA stat chat, Richmond white, Richmond's white population has increased by 30% since 
since 2005. Uh, per Columbia University study called Facing Whiteness between 2000 and 2016, Henrico and Chesterfield has seen an influx of minority populations. Uh, um, but during this period, the share of the white population in this county has decreased from nearly 72% to approximately 59% at the same time. This is the same time that we've been seeing this increase uh, in the white population, some calling it uh, reverse white flight. Uh, and so when we see this battle for space and history that I saw a lot of you all speaking about, and, and I know that uh, uh, Brother Duran and Anjali at the ICA really were talking about black space matters. And so uh, in light of this, Jackson Ward is both a space for celebration as we've been seeing, but it's also a cautionary tale when understanding how it has been disrupted disrupted by public policies that have helped to gerrymander, redline, and gentrify the community. Uh, just when we talk about housing, which Sheba and so many others have, have brought up, um, just in a presentation the city gave yesterday in their regional housing framework, uh, the median gross rent in Richmond has written, risen 20% since 2009, income only rising since 12%. 45% uh, of Richmond households are cost burdened, uh, and the median single family home sales price has increased 65%. Uh, just from 2009. And when you isolate the pricing for new construction homes, uh, it's, it's up almost 85%. And a lot of this is taking place uh, in historically black uh, communities, which are over 80% black. And whether you want to factor in subprime lending uh, in, the, in the recession and who got bailed out and who didn't, uh, when you look at the activities the city has subsidized in development versus helping people stay. Uh, the question that I have for uh, you all is, how have you seen uh, policies directly impacting the populations that you serve and what lessons can be learned to prevent the ward from falling victim to the next wave in urban renewal? Um, when I saw that question about the next wave, I was curious, like, you know, uh, you know, to, not to be funny, but it's like the first wave was uh, <laughs> <Right. laughs> like, what was the second wave? Where the second wave? I didn't know it was the second wave. So um, to, to answer the question, well, one of the things that I was fascinating was that um, uh, when it came to uh, tax incentives, uh, like a lot of the tax incentives for uh, or tax credits for uh, development, um, was was when you see the maps as to who got those mm -hmm. right they were not in jackson ward or they, they weren't in any of the formerly red line neighborhoods they were in like uh riverside uh river road in the west end right so while the city touts that they had these programs to help people you know what i mean do development or what have you a lot of that money went into places that didn't really need it in the first place um so when we talk about this idea of, of waves of, of removal of, of communities of color from uh, parts of the city. Uh, I'm gonna just say this, like I was working at Jackson, I was working at Jackson Water in 2000 and every day the conversation was about gentrification, right? And we watched it, You're like nobody did anything. I mean, and, 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 and to be candid, it was like very little that folks could do. You know what I mean? Honestly, it's, this is a market driven force. I mean, there's, to put the onus on communities of color to try to solve for uh, 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 issues that are created by capitalism in large is kind of is, is unfair, right? It's saying, okay, if y'all pull y'all pennies together, then maybe I could save Jackson. Ward. I mean, well, man, people were selling their houses for three hundred thousand dollars in Jackson Ward in the two thousands. So fast forward to two thousand twenty one, right? Uh, the only thing that I could see happening is that in small pockets in Jackson Ward, there, there will be retained black ownership. You know, there's black developers right now that are developing apartment complexes and things of that nature. And even the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust has control over several blocks of land in, um, uh, well, outside of Gilpin, right behind Shaco Cemetery, formerly spaces that were formerly owned by Maggie Walker and where the homes are like people like Bill Bojangles Robinson, right? But even with that, you still have the largest landowner in that area being Richmond Red Redevelopment Housing Authority, right? They own the entire Gilpin Court and associated properties throughout um, the other side of, uh, of Jackson Ward. So the question that we really should be asking is how do we get land redistributed into community hands? And that is a policy question, right? If the city owns property, there are usually two ways that they're giving that property away, 
or, or getting rid of that property uh, for either profit or community benefit. A is either getting auctioned off to Motley's auction group or is going into the Richmond Land Bank, right? Which then community members and developers can take those properties and turn them into either affordable housing or public green space, blah, blah, blah. I, I challenge all of us to engage our, our our city council people, right? And the mayor's office in, in, in assuring that more properties that are viable, that are, you know, not just, you know, um, leaned over decrepit to the side, not just blighted properties, but prime properties, I put it to the Richmond Land Bank, right? And I divert it from auction because the people that go to the auction are typically the people with the type of capital that they can make a make a power move that most uh, of our community members can't make. So I think that in terms of a policy, there is a there is a way to kind of save some pieces of Jackson Ward, um, and through that's through the land bank and, uh, and and trying to get those properties to the land bank. But I also caution as a cautionary tale, like you said, let's think about other black spaces in the city. You know, let's like use Jackson Ward as an example of what not to do. Right. Let's not ignore the black wells. Let's not ignore the rough and rose, the Davy Gardens. Let's not ignore the the Bell Meads. You know what I mean? Like there are spaces in the city that are still predominantly black, albeit they're still they're predominantly on the south side. Let's you know retain those spaces. Right. Invest in ownership of the land and community control of the land in those spaces, so that we can retain that black ownership. Can I, can I make a small point in relationship to that? Um, I, I think that something that, again, Deron raises that I think is critically important is for us to understand, not just in the context of, of, of as he, again, pretty adequately um, alluded to, uh, where we need to consider other spaces in the city in regards to land. We need to be clearer about our understanding in terms of why uh, African communities were disrupted with regard to Jackson Ward specifically, because it wasn't just a matter of moving people out. We're talking about literally and physically breaking up and blowing up, disrupting, creating a gigantic trench in the land itself removing the ability to be able to build, uh, whether it's business, whether it's residential, or to build and, and create space for people to be able to exist, live, congregate, build family and community. Uh, so that is unlike any of the other neighborhoods that have been disrupted in the city of Richmond where African people were then therefore removed is the uniqueness of what happened in Jackson Ward. And what it resulted in now, as we many of us have talked about our work or our relationship to Gilpin Court, and, and then the segregation on the very opposite, I mean the separation, excuse me, on the very opposite side of, um, uh, of what is that, the highway, um, where you have these, um, uh, the, the, I'll just say, uh, others with different class interests who have been able to capitalize off the, the utilization of that land space. So what we need to understand is, is our question can never be about solely just reclaiming, so to speak, that specific physical space because it's not there anymore. So what we have to do is make a clear, we have, to, we have to then therefore, in terms of our direction and our understanding of what we're going to do is one, uh, for the work that happens specifically in Gilpin, as we know that there are plans to, for all relative purposes, destroy the, uh, the, the public housing spaces as they exist, our organizing work needs to be along the lines of how do we make sure that we maintain control of that space specifically along with the development that happens on it. It can't just be a matter of a grand scheme that is uh, produced by the city to say, hey, we're going to create all this opportunity, whatever that, excuse me, whatever that's supposed to mean um, in order for folks to, for other folks to benefit from it without taking consideration of how directly do the residents of that space currently and their descendants and those who would come into that space, but you know, at, at whatever point in time they move to this, excuse me, around the surrounding area, um, how they can then therefore benefit collectively as well. Um, I just, yeah, I, wanted, I, th I thought it was important to add yeah. that. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in on, and I think what Deron said and um, uh, Brother Shabazz said was just perfect on, and um, I'm gonna just speak like to the word inclusion. Um, a lot of the things around gerrymandering and, and uh, gentrification is, uh, is foreign talk to the people that live in these spaces, right? So one of the things that I feel as far as the next wave, you know, I think what Deron said was key, you know, let's talk about the first wave. So let's educate the next wave on the first wave. So that way when they're in these spaces, 
they can make decisions and they can learn to educate themselves and understand the empowerment of inclusion. So that way city and state is not making decisions for them. I think that's one of the big things that, um, you know, along with changing policy and, and, and going to legislation and things that we're doing as activists is really going back to the people. I think a lot of times we forget the people have a lot of the power and, and a lot of that is, uh, is empowered through us educating them simultaneously while doing the work on the legislation and in state level to change a lot of the laws and things like that. So, you know, I think, you know, just the next wave has to be informed about the first wave. And that's one of the things that we're finding, you know, through the work we're doing with Community 5050, through the youth and family, a lot of them don't even know what's going on around them. It's like they're walking in a, in, in a delusion of what's really going on. And some people may know, but don't feel like how it's really impacting them because they're just so numb and, um, and, and just used to being disenfranchised and used to people telling them what to do that they don't even feel like they have a voice or power in their own community. I, I have I have a lot to say, but I'm not going to take a lot of time. We're going to talk about history and, mm -hmm. and how gentrification starts. It starts with the census that goes back 10 years. They start mm -hmm. looking at medium income to determine whose property can be taken in the next decade, who can mm -hmm. be pushed out by the economic terrorism of, you know, how much you make. The fact that our minimum wage on the state level was $7.25 for years. And it never kept up with the cost of living. My, my population, the, the people that I serve are people who are just as involved, people who have felony convictions. Felonization started in, in the beginning of time after slavery ended, and, and we weren't told that slavery ended. Right here in Virginia, there was a, a convention that got together to say, how do we keep the most black people from voting? from being involved in the process, from, from gaining wealth. We have so many examples of black thriving communities that were pushed out of spaces and forced to live in what people thought were subpar communities. And they built those communities up and they were destroyed by white violence. A lot of people know about the Tulsa violence, but a lot of people don't know about the DC riots. A lot of people don't know about the Knoxville, Tennessee riots. A lot of people don't know about the Red Summer and the New York draft riots. All of those things were put together to push Black people further out of generational wealth. And, and it's not as simple as um, let's focus on housing and making things better because when redlining happened, and all of these things are happening simultaneously and at a systemic level. When redlining happened, and, and we ju I just saw an article yesterday where Richmond Redevelopment had moved, physically moved <laughs> houses and set and, and allow them to be empty and abandoned. And now they're mm -hmm. revamping those houses and putting them back in the community because a, a highway was ran through there. And, and I'm not talking about the one on, on Jackson Ward on First Street, I'm talking about over in the West End. So this isn't something that is new. These things are systemic and they have been going on forever. So when we talk about felonization, we talk about Carter Glass and, and all of these people getting together to disenfran purposely disenfranchise as many black people as possible. We talk about economic terrorism. We talk about the fact that if you get a felony conviction, you are pushed out of the ability to vote. You are, you are disenfranchised by not being able to express your voice. You are subject to certain jobs and, and have caps on your income where people can legally discriminate against you because you have a past conviction, even if you have done your state sanctioned time, they can say you can't be licensed in certain professions, even though Department of Corrections teaches these trades and makes amounts of money off of people's back while they're incarcerated for a lot of these corporate entities that will pay a person 23 cents while they're in prison, but won't hire them when they come out. So if we say, let's fix this problem and allow more people to participate in the home ownership process it's not that simple because i'll tell you what happened with me and my husband who both have 800 credit scores assets income credit no history of eviction what have you we were discriminated against twice it mm -hmm. took us almost a year to purchase our our first home because the company took us through so many things they asked us what school my daughter went to that has nothing to do with the application process so you know it, it's more than let's just make this opportunity available 
we have to be intentional about making the terms better for people who can't necessarily afford the process. And it is not, it is not to fall on deaf ears when I say that it is very intentional to make sure that certain people are who are at certain levels of income still don't qualify for what their white counterparts qualify for. So um, it, it's a lot to be said there about the systems and mm -hmm. how all of these things come together to make sure that these people are pushed out because even, even things like the reverse mortgage loan process where black families own properties and a company will come in and I won't name the company, but you can look it up because it's right here on Broad Street, um, mm -hmm. will come in and say, we will give you a loan for the equity in your home, all of the equity in your home. And you can live here and you don't have to make payments on this loan until you pass away. And what happens when that, that person passes away, instead of passing that property down to their family, the company comes in and says, you can either sell this property they don't tell you the terms of the loan because you didn't negotiate the project, the, the you know, process, and they force you to take on a debt or sell the home and take what is left over from all of the equity they took out of the loan. So these things are happening and they have been happening since the beginning of time to make sure that certain people don't stay in place. So, so I know that we're talking about Jackson Ward and like where the center of like our economics is, but this is, this is all over the city and the population that I serve has been caught in this trap where we were pushed into certain communities that we, we so nicely call courts now, but they are projects. They were projects and they were, they were put together and designed to push people in certain places and not give them upward mobility. Because we, if we were serious about making sure that people were successful, we would make sure that when they come into these housing communities, they would get the tools necessary to be able to get up and elevate, elevate from that situation. So we wouldn't be in the situation we are now where now the properties are set to be destroyed. And they're scrambling to figure out where are all these people going to go. We can't just push everybody out to the counties and allow the spaces to be taken over. We have to be intentional about making sure that our people can stay in place and, and build on the history that they started with without the threat of white violence coming to remove those communities and the culture that came behind it. Yeah, that's very accurate. And one of the things that I, I love to remind people is that just because something is current doesn't mean that it is new. And so when you look at really when you the same way that urban renewal and the plans of Harlem Bartholomew were not just in Richmond, but you know, I, I talked to organizers, uh, black organizers in Canada, there's a there's a, a city in Vancouver, I think called um, uh, uh, Hogan's Alley, uh, that a highway was built through the black part of town. And I'm talking to them, I said, Hey, uh, where was that at? And I'm looking it up and look, it's Harlem Bartholomew. So these are plans that were that were, were placed that had economic impacts, they had political uh, uh, impacts uh, on, on, on those areas as well. And so what a lot of people don't recognize when we talk about gentrification, especially how which houses are being sent to tax sale, uh, what, what does it mean when uh, uh, grandma can't stay in her house and can't pass it down to her uh, uh, descendants to use as, I was talking to entrepreneurs who, Black entrepreneurs who said, it's because my uncle had a house that I was able to get collateral for a loan for my business. But if he was priced out of his home or or or, or uh, didn't have the ability to retain that, that also affects the type of businesses and and the, the wealth that we have generationally. And so it's that same type of current that's kind of flowing in what we can see through Jackson Ward that's happening uh, all over the city. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the uh, prices uh, uh, going up in Northside as well. And the same struggles that we're seeing with who's being subsidized by the city uh, in, 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 in Black homes is also happening with Black businesses as well. There's some interesting uh, research out of uh, Columbus, Ohio uh, by Trayvon Logan, who talked, who overlaid uh, maps of redlining uh, and then black businesses that were available during the green book to be a safe haven for travelers. And as he looked back, not only were the black homes disappearing, but a lot of those uh, uh, dots where the green book businesses were are also kind of disappearing. And so uh, as we are seeing these things as well, these are decisions that are being made. These are choices that are being made. These are urban city plans that are being made on who is getting subsidized versus who is not. When you have developers who can get 10, 15 year tax abatements, but we just made a $4 million cut to tax relief for 
seniors and the disabled, right? So these are uh, these all have to do with uh, a lot of the city planning that happens. And so when we're speaking about uh, the spatial politics of a place, uh, it was not just voting and gerrymandering, but what is the culture of that place? What wealth is being developed or, and you know, what's being knocked down and who's getting pushed out? Uh, it still is the same type of reasoning uh, that was used that we saw within Jackson Ward. Uh, one of the things that I want to touch on as well um, because this is also about standing on uh, the shoulders of people who have come. So we also are standing on a history. Uh, my question is also, um, you all shared a little bit about whose shoulders you all are standing on. Uh, can you speak uh, on how your work is involving the next generation uh, and not just fighting for what space will they be able to uh, occupy within the city, but uh, their, their ability and their political ability to imagine and implement their imaginations on the space of Richmond. Who are you, who are you mentoring and um, what's your work looking like for the next generation um, that embodies the same type of spirit and room that was provided for us by uh, the leaders in Jackson Ward? Um, so, you know, uh, I think that it's imperative for us to teach our children about how we develop strategies and systems. Uh, and that it's one thing for us to be educated about the problems that our communities face and to know the history of the problems that our communities have faced. And it's a whole nother thing to engage them in critical thinking, to be able to process strategies that can move the needle forward for, the, for our communities. Um, I see a lot of us like we, you know, a lot of our a lot of our work overlooks that strategizing part and that critical envisioning, what I like to call radical imagining, right? Can you imagine a future where Black people have control of land and are developing community assets, businesses, homes, unimpeded by white supremacist forces? And if you can imagine that, what does it look like? For, what does it take for us to get there? Right, and working with young people to, you know, imagine those realities and being able to even see that the way it looks in our work is, you know, we're collaborative with uh, organizations like Groundworks, uh, and those young people that work with us, you know, we do a lot of public green space building, right? So our community orchards, our community gardens, urban farms. We got these young people out there building rain, rainwater harvesting systems with solar power infused into it, permeable pathways. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different type of work, but those young people get to say, hey, look, I was participatory in that. And then they're using their critical thinking skills to figure out how do I develop this plumbing system? You know what I mean? To uh, ensure that these uh, trees get watered that'll be here for the next five, 10 years, right? Um, and, I, and I'll be honest, I think that uh, it's tough work to do um, because A, uh, you've got to hold space, not only for the young people, but, the, but you have to have resources. So it's, it goes beyond just a palliative. It's easy for us to give food to kids and like after school tutoring and things like that. There's a whole nother thing to like provide them the resources so that they can create, that they can co-create the world that they want to see. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, that's the struggle uh as 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 it stands for us is like tapping into those resources so, so that these young people can create the world that they want to see instead of it just being like hey you know we got these uh we got these veggies for you come get some free food you know what i'm saying or come get these backpack with school supplies you know not to shake i'm not shaking down anybody that does that work i'm just saying that that's that's like catching the baby out the, out of the out of the end of the river like how do we stop somebody from throwing the babies in the river is the first place. It's the type of work that I feel like we need to be engaged in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I, I, I would definitely say that that's the, that's the shoulders that we stand on is like critical thinking, movement building, you know, organizing uh, uh, for uh, black communities explicitly and not organizing in terms of like doing protests and rallies, but I'm talking about organizing to create a new reality for, the, for tomorrow, for our, for our people. And um, lastly, I just want to say that, you know, I, I appreciate that remark in, reg in regards to uh, gentrification happening all over the place. One of the things that I feel is super hard for us to get through our heads is that this stuff that we talk about that's happening in Richmond is so much bigger than Richmond. Mm -hmm. Bro, bro, when you get to organizing outside of the city, 
and you work with people in DC and Baltimore and Philly and Chicago Philly, yeah. and Atlanta and Raleigh, Durham and San Diego and Cleveland, Ohio and Philly, Philadelphia, and you see you comparing notes with brothers and sisters that look just like you that are doing, that are going through the same exact thing. It's the same script, but different leads in the roles, right? That's when you start to realize that, yo, man, this shit is so much bigger than Richmond, that this is a global reality that we're facing, right? And when you start to expand your, your, your thoughts on it, it's like, okay, we start local, but remember that this is global phenomenon. This, this is a battle against white supremacy, corporate capitalistic control of communities of color across the globe. Look at what's happening in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, South Africa right now is, is erupting in revolution, right? On one side of the, of the highway is 80% black and on the other side of the highway is 90% white. And this is, in, this is 2021. So I just asked, uh, I, I would encourage people that work directly with youth, man, like help them understand that this is a global reality that they're living in. And that what's happening in Richmond, Virginia is not just Richmond. This is, this is happening all over the place. Get them connected to other, other youth, other community organizers from outside of the city you know, let help them see models of community organizing and community engagement that's gonna uh, expand their thought process and their, their their critical thinking ability, right? That's gonna help them imagine, you know, new ways of doing this shit that that looks be that looks way way more involved than what we're seeing right now in in our, in our region. Absolutely, that's that's yeah. One of the things that. Uh... No, go ahead, I was gonna say, uh, yeah, definitely critical thinking. Yeah, I was gonna say definitely critical thinking, and that's one of the things that you know Community Fifty Fifty prides itself on with engaging our youth with critical thinking through our lyrics and beats workshop. So it's not just about music, right? So the music and the art is a way to engage. Once you engage them, now you can pretty much inform with anything. Um, one of the youth from lyrics and beats, you know, with understanding policy and ownership and uh, IP and, and bringing on your own intellectual property. Uh, Zuri uh, Fleming, she started her own LLC and has her own record label. She ain't but 19. So we talking about shifting the narrative and ownership and understanding the empowerment of it. The first thing we have to do is find strategic ways to engage our youth. And I think a lot of times we come in and saying, okay, we're going to do this. We need to do this. Do you need to know that? It's building those relationships with the youth and families to understand what information they can want to receive. And then once they can receive it, now empowering, empowering them to go out in the communities abroad to, you know, make change. Because a lot of times, you know, we don't meet people where they are. You know, we come in with our own agendas, our own objectives, or what we think they should know. But, you know, that form is that now you can know where to strategically go. So definitely, you know, exposing the youth in the city to, you know, other youth in other cities, um, other youth that are doing the same work and using their voice to express themselves. Is, is understanding how they can use their voice for empowerment. And then also now it goes to changing policy. Now, if you can use your voice to uh, empower yourself, you can sit at the city hall. You can go and speak before you know your city council and, and start getting changed. Now you have that confidence because a lot of you don't think they can do it. Yeah, I would, I would even just say that in addition to um, identifying these points of encouragement for uh, cultivating empowerment. We also want to start raising awareness and raising education levels around how we develop our own systems of governance, how we develop our own systems of existing in the world so that it's not just reliant on the policies that have been imposed on us, but that we create our own systems of justice. We create our own systems of how we, you know, for other purposes, how we um, relate to each other in terms of community so that we're meeting our needs the way that we want to meet those needs. We're defining what those needs are and we're we're building things we're producing uh services or we're producing uh goods uh that that meet those needs at the highest levels possible and where we don't have the skill or the know-how in terms of how to build those things then we can learn from others we can learn from the historic examples that have been laid before us and then determine for ourselves how do we want to use this information how do we want to use this to resolve the problems that exist for us in a present context Absolutely. And that's so important. And, and um, Deron, I really resonated with what you were saying and, and recognizing that these are patterns that have 
emerged. This was a strategy that was emerged. And so if we're facing a strategy, we have to implement a strategy as well. I've been um, really looking into Philadelphia's a lot of uh, similarities to what we're going on with our city and, and man, I wish we had more time because we could talk about, you know, what is the role of expansion of uh, university and how does that change uh, things that is order maintenance policing and how that intersects with the criminal justice system. Uh, but, you know, we're short on time. So uh, I want to thank you all for um, uh, your input. I want to give people that opportunity. Uh, we want to transition to our Q&A portion um, as well. If there's anyone in the audience that has any questions, you can use the Q&A portion. Uh, if, you, if you go down on your Zoom to the furthest right, right next to the raise hand button is Q&A. So you can put in questions for, so our audience has the opportunity to participate and ask any questions they may have. Uh, for any of our uh, legends and anchors on uh, on on screen here, um, and question. while quick sorry. question, can, can Jackson chime in real quick? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, this was an amazing discussion. Um, you know, it's not lost on us that Library of Virginia, Rich Public Library, are partnering with us to provide this platform for these type of conversations. They're honest and they're long overdue. Um, when we think about Jackson, um, you know, Jackson is a framework for us because we feel like every community has a Jackson. And when we say community, we mean cities. There are Jacksons all over the, the globe, as Duran said. And the Jackson framework, um, it's, it's undergirded by eight pillars. And they are preservation, pedagogy, philanthropy, proprietorship, as well as public engagement, public programming, public art, and public service by way of public policy. Mm -hmm. And the reason why those are the pillars that Anjali and I came up with is because, you know, we asked this question, who is Jackson? It really led us to the origin story about Jackson Ward. And when you actually understand the origin story of Jackson Ward, it kind of goes to what Sheba is saying and Deron and everyone on this panel saying, we don't have to imagine what it can look like because Jackson Ward did look like this. During urbanized enslavement, we had Black Richmonders who were building intergenerational wealth while still in technical bondage. Because of the financial fortitude that Black Richmonders were exercising well before Reconstruction even emerges, coupled with the, the electoral you know, and, and political prowess that then they were handed down with 1871, that's why Jackson Ward was gerrymandered because we weren't realizing what it meant to be Black homeowners, entrepreneurs. We have the first black homeowner in Abraham Peyton Skipwith in 1793, not 1893. A lot of time we talk about the shoulders of Maggie L. Walker and John Mitchell, but they were standing on shoulders from 1793. This is a black man who not only owned a home, but had the, one of the first, if not the first fully executed will in the entire city of Richmond with not only plans for how he wanted his home to be used for his family, but how he wanted to leverage the home as a space of entrepreneurship. And so I think that when we talk about getting to gerrymandered, we have to, or to gentrify, we have to really start kind of with what Sheba was saying with how we use public policy, the historical context, all the way going back to, to being a gerrymandered space. And if I can say one more thing, I know Brother Iman was talking about the fact that the neighborhood was literally gutted, you know, in urban renewal and between 1952 and 1958. I know that whenever Anjali and I are approached about Jackson Ward, which is often because Jackson Ward is on the top of, you know, on the tips of everyone's tongue. We hear a lot about this one-to-one -one placement, you know, for every new, new development coming in, somebody should stay. And I was telling Anjali recently, I don't know if this is even a term, but I believe in one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. For every new person you bring in Jackson Ward, one person needs to stay and one person needs to be brought back who is displaced because descendants were, they, they were robbed of intergenerational wealth. And when you make sure that one person stays and you bring one person back, it, it should also be connected to pipelines to home ownership, not just rentals. And so I think, because I think someone put in the chat, what can the city do? There's a lot, not only to repair and repart, but also the path forward. So I just wanted to chime in and I know Angelie probably is going to want to say something too. No, I mean, I think what you're saying is spot on. I, I also just want to echo that this is an excellent panel. I was getting text messages during the talk saying this is like, the best panel I've ever seen, uh, especially like coming through a space like the Library of Virginia. So we appreciate the platform. Um, you know, as Cisha said, what we have and what everyone really has been saying, what we have in Jackson Ward is in many ways a blueprint. When we talk about this idea of uh, 
just how insidious this idea of gentrification is and uh, urban revitalization, that it's not something that's just living in the Richmond space, it's something that's going across the country. You know, maybe what we have in Jackson Ward and its history and potentially its current moment um, is a blueprint for what it means to kind of put a stop to some of this. I don't know if we can put a genie back in the bottle, but I think that we can be creative in the ways in which we approach things. And some of that lives in the policy space. I feel like a lot of conversation happens around uh, what can an administration do? What kind of pressure can we put on an administration? And that is valuable and we need to keep our foot on the gas in that space. But I don't think we in there. I think when we look historically, when strides were made, even in the last year, when strides were made, it's really the people who are saying, well, you know what, I'll ask for forgiveness later. I'm not asking for permission for the things that need to change to get changed right now, right? So what you have in a person like an Abraham Skip with is a person who said, well, I'm not waiting for uh, the law to decide that I'm a full human being and that I should not be in bondage. I'm gonna figure my way out. And that's what you have in a Harriet Tubman. That's what you have even in people that we celebrate like a, a Martin Luther King or a, a Malcolm X. These are people who are thinking outside of the confines of policy, of administration, of our you know, dem democracy in this structure. And so what I just wanna encourage us to do is kind of keep that revolutionary mindset, uh, yes, within putting pressure on the administration, but outside of that. And how do we take some level of responsibility um, in our own personal autonomy as a community and creating the realities that we want to see. And that can be easier said than done. I'm, I'm not trying to romanticize this idea. It takes work. But I think it's work that we can find support for. And I think that if we can galvanize the energy that was built over 2020 um, and use it in the right way and not let that window of opportunity close on us, there's something genuinely progressive to be done in Jackson Ward to let it be that blueprint. Because when we think about the, the land trust, when we think about the city, when we think about our RHA, when we think about what Cisha just said, one to one to one. And I mean, we haven't said it in this conversation yet, but let's not forget about this idea of reparations, right? And what reparations really means. And that can look like a check, which means something. You know, a lot of times people are like, oh, well, that'll just be money. Money matters, right? So sometimes it lives in the space of money. Sometimes it lives in the space of property ownership. Sometimes it lives in the space of access to certain resources that we have just been kept away from. And so I think we have to also just not be shy about utilizing the term reparations and then being really open about the way in which we approach the term and what we define it as and how we hold people accountable to give to reparting you know at the end of the day because there are many communities that have had uh resources reparted onto them from the american government and there's no reason that we shouldn't also uh receive that and so i just want to make sure that we keep that as an active part of the conversation as well I think that's um, absolutely, I'll oh, go at you. Oh, go ahead, because I know we're getting on time. Go ahead. Yes, because I, I, I know we're, we're, we're tight on time. Um, and we do have a question from the audience, but I think that is, I think that is important. And, I, you know, not being afraid of the concept of reparations, uh, a lot of the, uh, the where we got is pretty much as a city, we got what we paid for. Uh, we subsidized who we subsidized and we didn't subsidize who we didn't subsidize. And so the answer to that uh, is gonna have to come through uh, some form of, of, of repair. And so I think a lot of times people don't think of policy as a form of, 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 of repair. And so that it could be things such as reparative rights. It could be that due our legacy of displacement, we don't send uh, uh, b legacy black owned homes to uh, to tax sale. It could be that if someone if someone had a credit, uh, a tax credit for seniors when they pass it on to the next generation because we want to keep that wealth in the family, that we allow some of that tax credit uh, uh, and relief to stay for the next generation so that can stay within the family and circulate within our communities. So there's a lot of uh, ideas and when we're uh, uh, talking about what, the, what does reparations uh, look like within this context. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Uh, we did have one question, uh, and how are we doing on time, Cisha, by the way, also? I, I think we actually have to wrap it up. I know Brother Iman okay. responded, but, but one more thing, because Anjali did talk about reparations. Can we also just mention responsibility? 
Mm-hmm. You know, we have to be honest with Jackson Project, me and Anjali get emails all day about Jackson Ward. And a lot of it is from white Richmonders or white transplants that are moving to Jackson Ward and they wanna know more. And if we talk about responsibility, we also have to understand this is the first historically registered black urban neighborhood in the country. This is sacred space. So there's also a responsibility to homeowners who are coming into this space to ask themselves, is this space for me? Like, and I think that in addition to reparations, we just have to talk about the responsibility of those who say they are allies and say they wanna help us in this work, as should these spaces be reserved for black rich members. I think it's gonna be important too. And I think that's just a, a paradigmatic shift that has to happen for just the country and society as a whole, because people look to take advantage of opportunities. What they see in Jackson Ward is an opportunity. Like Deron, I was introduced to Jackson Ward in two, early 2000s, 2001 to be exact. And there were homes for sale literally for $13,000. You know, it, it, at the time, this, this is the moment when it made the endangered uh, neighborhoods list. And what, what we might not have known then, but quickly learned is that that is a bat signal to developers across the country, you know, people who have disposable income to come in, gobble these homes up in mass, and then turn them around and flip them for literally 10 times what they purchased them for. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know, I just feel like when I think about responsibility, we're, I feel like we're so far away from that in some ways, because America is just so as, as the mentality of it is so deeply entrenched in in the dollar you know it's it's the cost versus the value the value for us is in the historical relevance of the space but for them the value is in the cost and that's the thing that kind of reigns supreme and so hopefully in this moment you know we kind of lead people to a shift in mentality a shift in mindset and understanding that there are other layers uh to this co- this concept of value um but unfortunately, that is what we see just being extremely is pervasive through Jackson Ward, through the city. I mean, and Jackson Ward is not the only neighborhood in Richmond that's affected by this. <laughs> As Deron said, the only one that's almost not touched is the rough and roads. I mean, because even, even Manchester, Blackwell, that's already affected. I mean, all of Richmond has just, been, I mean, where, where are you going to go? When I'm looking at homes, I'm like, I, I tell you, I bought a home in 2007. For $140,000 in Northside. That home today just sold for $380,000. How is that possible in the span of 10 years in a city where it's not a whole bunch more jobs that have been developed? People aren't making a ton more money. I mean, the, the concept of that to me is just outrageous. And so, you know, it, I don't know. I just feel like we have a, a ton of work to do on this idea of responsibility. It, it, it spans across a whole bunch of folks. You don't mute, Deron. I was gonna say it's capitalism, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All day. That's how it works, Jack. Man, you just told you like 30% white people left out of the uh, out of Chesterfield and Rico, and they came 20% increase of white folks in Richmond. And mm. Richmond ain't getting no more bigger. Mm. They ain't making no more new land in Richmond. So it's, 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 a, it's the law of displacement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Supply and demand. You know and I mean, the demand is there. They're like, yo. I mean, I was. I, I was top that $400,000 house right up the block from where I live on North Avenue because supply and demand. You know what I'm saying? Dude flipped it. He made the improvements. That's what it's worth as far as the value, considering, you know, what all the other houses in this, in this neighborhood is going for because people want to live in the city that you seem want to live over here. All of a sudden. I say, look, look, look. But I like when 4th of July reminds them where they live. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just to talk about a neighborhood adjacent to Jackson Ford, and I know we have to go, but think about Carver, right? Where you still have a concentration of black people living there. But, you know, you see slowly but surely VCU trickling in. But was reading an article someone shared with me the other day the properties, uh, those condos that are right across the street from Maggie Walker High School, just sold for $2 million a piece to VCU. They just dropped $8 million on a, a, a quarter of a block, right? And so whatever they plan to do with that property, what is, what is the impact that that's going to have on those homes in Carver? 
right? What is that going to do to the tax values? Are we going to see the slow but sure pushing out of the few Black people who are left over there? And the next thing you know, it's the expansion of the athletic facilities of VCU. You know, you don't, you don't mute again, Deron. <laughs> I'll ask you I ain't gonna keep, I, I'm not going to keep talking. I, look, and I hate to be nihilistic and like no. very pessimistic about this, but yo, in light of like uh, the fall of capitalism, like what everything that you're saying is about to happen. I mean, there's no, there's no way around it. Like there's literally like, you, know, you can't make a law that says that this guy can't sell his house to a private developer. And if somebody come with the right price, like, yo, grandma's dead. Cats is like, yo, no, you know, I'm, not many people are gonna turn down, you know, large figures for the, for, for, for the land based off of the historical value. Like, I mean, I think some of us would maybe, but you know, realistically, there's a lot of folks that are challenged financially out here, and you know, being able to make a move with large influxes of capital based off of land that they're not accessing, you know what I mean? They're not using, and it would take them way more money to actually improve the property to turn it into a rental. Yeah, it's gone, Jack. Like. Let's not be let's not be uh, naive or Care Bear unicorn eyes. Like maybe there'll be some nice person that'll you know, yo. In real time, there's hundreds of people that are literally like losing their home today. Like I had like let me just tell you the story. I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit mute and I'm gonna just be quiet. No, it's okay. The house that I live in right now, so uh, purchased by my partner's grandparents. In the night in the uh, in the 1950s, house was built in the 1920s, right? Uh, family member that was living in the house before us could not afford to. Uh, we were on fixed income, couldn't afford the uh, taxes and the increase in taxes in the in the in the area. So house was on the verge of foreclosure. So me and my partner decided to take over the mortgage, and here we are. This is rare. Not many people. You know what I'm saying? Have family members that have the that have the financial fortitude to be like, all right, boom. Instead of this house going to the bank and the bank uh, foreclosing on the house and then it going into tax delinquency or whatever, whatever. Like, nah, there's not many people that have the financial fortitude to be like, all right, boom. I'm gonna come take this joint over and we're gonna do the repairs and we're gonna fix it up and we're gonna, you know what I mean, keep this in the family. You know what I mean for generations to come because we know that the house is worth well more than its current state. Right. And then when we do the improvements, it'll be worth even more. And we can keep it in the family use as a wealth building tool. And multiply that scenario by all the north side, what's happening on south side, what's already happened in the east end. And that'll give you the answer to the situation that we're facing. Like the, if we can replicate collective community care, support that can start to take these properties on then maybe we got a way out, you know what I'm saying? Or if there's a philanthropist that's willing to like put money into a trust to preserve and conserve these homes and make them affordable housing, then maybe we got a way out. But those are crap shoots at best. So I'm gonna just leave it at that. Maybe somebody's on the call that's got that kind of bread that's ready to do that thing. And if so, you know, let's talk. I'd love to see it happen. No, it's it's absolutely you know correct as as Dr. King said we we must rapidly make this shift from being a thing oriented society to a person oriented society because when the profit motive runs unchecked then the triple evils of militarism, uh, uh, racism and capitalism and poverty uh, uh, become inconquerable right now this is the optimist king this is the i have a dream who in 68 says my dream be carrying a nightmare because perhaps i was a little too naive and so if it is this profit motive it is the value system we talk about responsibility uh it's easy for us to to, to just say well the profit motive lives in city hall right uh does it happen to you know i i met so many equitable developers who said you know what when i see how neighborhoods are changing i've just made a decision in, in, in the, you know, and they could have been sitting high in a seller's market right now that said, I don't do more than one or two houses in an area because I know what that will mean for their neighbors. When I even look at my neighbor, uh, my former neighbor, 
Mr. Red, who was renting across the street from me. It was a house. It was a, the back when the neighborhood wasn't as booming that someone was renting. My my neighbor who bought his house lived in that house, and that was his path to upward mobility for him to be able to buy a house. But now with the market going up, I saw two houses go up on my street worth three hundred eighty thousand dollars. I literally come back next week, and my neighbor is gone. And everybody wants to know what happened to him. Where is he going? What happened is the market changed and selling became more profitable than renting. And we see the sign going up and I get mad every time I look across the neighborhood because he was our neighborhood watch. That was the spirit of the community. But how do you put a price tag on Mr. Red? Where does he fall in the profit motive? Where does he fall into the incentives and who we keep? And it is that same type of profit motive and that same type of uh uh, uh, reaction and infrastructure is, is, is what we are facing. And that's not just, it, though it also includes because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if this person got a tax abatement. So, so that doesn't just live in city hall, but that responsibility lives within us. It lives for people who move into the neighborhoods for the people when I was <laughs> running for office would roll down, chase me down to say, Hey, I know I'm a gentrifier. What can I do? You know, maybe I shouldn't get my new basement or, or put, you know, <laughs> you know, the gentrifier font that we talk about is a little joke, but anyways, you know, it's like, what can we do? Right. So this is a shared responsibility that we have uh, Jackson Ward. What happened to Jackson Ward is a cautionary tale, not just for people who are in city hall, but for people who aren't elected, for people who are flipping houses, for people that are buying things from tax sale and saying, you know, what is, do I want to disrupt this generational wealth so that I can I can flip that. That is a, a, a change and a revolution of thinking. As Gail's out here and said, the revolution will not be televised because that's the change in thought that you can't even take a picture of that will put us into a different situation. And so I thank you all for uh, contributing to this conversation. And this is a, a continual revolution of thought. This is the uh, Senko Five, Brother Mon talked about and Sister Shisha talked about. This is what we can go back and get the, the philosophy of Maggie Walker, they didn't just say, I'm going to turn my pennies into dollars, but let us put our pennies together and put turn our pennies into collective dollars. And so that is the legacy that we have. Uh, these are the crises that we face, we face, but thankfully Jackson Ward left us a blueprint that we can continue to build upon today. And with that, I'll, I'll give it back to the Moon Sisters. That was mic drop for me. Straight up, that was a wonderful closing. Greg, you wanna chime in as you close us out? Your thoughts? Yeah, I just wanna thank everybody. It was a fantastic panel. Um, certainly gave me a lot to think about. Uh, we talked earlier when before the session about this commission I'm gonna be working for, and I think there's a lot here that they need to hear. So thanks to all of you and um, look forward to the next session. We're gonna have two more of these programs and I'm sure that just, th this was this was amazing. Thank you. Yes, our next, before we, anyone logs off, our next session will be on Wednesday, August 18th. It's gonna be called the Virginia Way. And we're gonna have an action pack panel yet again with uh, institutions across the city. Um, some that might've had oppressive origins and talking about how they are committed to redefining a new way for Virginia moving forward. So that whole dynamic of the past 150 and the next 150. So hopefully you'll join us. Right. Thanks everyone for coming and for staying. Uh, we appreciate all the attendees and thank you panelists for an amazing discussion. <laughs>